Everybody, Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, New Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. Well, Tuesday here on this show, and you know what that means. We've got a lot to talk about here today. The usual and the unusual. The usual, of course, is Raw last night. I got some stuff to say about that show. A lot of improvements. The thing that will not be improved is the length of the show. But we'll talk about the highs and lows of Raw. We've also got NXT 2.0 coming up tonight. It's a big show. They're calling it Heat Wave. NXT Heat Wave with a number of matches. We have five matches announced for the show. Three of them are championship matches. One is a potential loser leaves town match. I guess not loser leaves town, but the loser could leave town, depending on who the loser is. And uh, and plenty more. And then, of course, we've got the unusual. Not every day we hear about record-breaking ticket sale numbers for WWE. WrestleMania 39 tickets have gone on sale. And in the first 24 hours, they have sold over 90,000 tickets for the two nights of WrestleMania. These are gigantic numbers. 42% increase over first day sale for WrestleMania 38 in Dallas. So WWE is hot at the moment. We'll tell you about that. And uh, also the WWE quarterly earnings revenue report is out. Uh, revenues of over $328 million for the quarter. Increase of over $63 million from the same time period in 2021. We'll talk about all of that. And uh, G1, we've got the finals, the semifinals set, which will lead to the finals. We'll tell you who ended up the block winners. If you don't want to know, show's taking place. I don't know what to tell you. That'll be later on in the program. If you want text us, 425-780-7566. That is 425-780-7566. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. Ah, just finished right? running that hill about 10 minutes ago. What hill? Doing my, uh, I got this gigantic hill here at the beach. I'm doing my cardio. Getting in shape for this match coming up, everybody. Yeah, Who's right going to be there? Who's going to be in Chicago for this match? Oh, my God. The only hill you walked over was a little sand dune so you could go lay your butt down there. And I don't think you're taking this seriously enough. I'm telling you, the frustrations that Filthy Tom has for you. Tell you, iron sharpens iron. You think he's tiring himself out over there. Rejuvenated spirit. You hear him at the end of those promos every single time he wrestles. Yeah, I hear him exhausted. You, he's got something for you. He's exhausted. I, mm. I'm in my prime. NXT Heat Wave is tonight, everybody. And we got a bunch of big matches. My goal for this match is to look bigger than J.D. McDonough. I think I'm going to pull it off. I think but anyway, so. <laughs> he's he's going to be facing Braun Breaker. Ouch. I, I feel that I'm a little past J.D. McDonough, and I'm heading towards Braun Breaker territory. I'm not sure I'm going to make it by the time the match rolls around, but I'm doing my best. But anyway, they're facing off for the NXT title. You have better and, intensity, uh, that's for sure. Yeah. Better promo. We got Mandy Rose versus Zoe Stark for the NXT Women's title. Carmelo Hayes and Giovanni Vinci for the North American title. Santos Escobar versus Tony D'Angelo. It's a street fight. If Tony D'Angelo wins, Escobar leaves NXT and finds fame and fortune on the main roster. Please. Otherwise, he stays down there with his blokes. Sorry. And then Roxanne Perez versus Cora Jade. As I look at this card, honestly, these are my predictions. Ready? Good. I think that uh, Cora Jade beats Roxanne Perez. I, I agree. think that I think that Tony D'Angelo beats. No, I'm sorry. I think Santos Escobar wins, and he frees his crew. Unfortunately, and the only reason I say that honestly is because if if Hunter sees something in Santos Escobar, and I'm sure he does, but I mean, if he has intentions to bring him up to the main roster. Why do you bring him up to the main roster and not bring up Legado del Fantasma? It doesn't even make any sense. And the stipulation is that if, if Santos Escobar loses, only he leaves. Tony D'Angelo holds on to the other two. So because of that, I think that they're all going to be staying in NXT as a, as a trio. I believe that Carmelo Hayes is beating Giovanni Vinci. I believe that Braun Breaker is beating J.D. McDonough. And I believe that Zoe Stark will win 
the NXT Women's Championship from Mandy Rose. You know, I was thinking about this, too. Have you seen, uh, you've been watching this show, Mike? You've seen Cora Jade lately? She comes out and she doesn't have the skateboard anymore. Now yeah, she comes out with, like, a, a stick or something. Yeah, yeah. And I, I was thinking about it, and uh, when you really think about it, she's a much better heel coming out with that skateboard as a really? as a, uh, as a poser. Even after everything really, happened with really the skateboard? Skate. Yeah. But the I skateboard think went into business skate- for itself. I think he, she Her, may be done with that thing. Her gimmick should be a worked skateboarder. She can't really skate, but she comes out with that skateboard. But that's been the gimmick the whole time, hasn't it? Well, no. She was supposed to be a, a legitimate skateboarder. That was like it's a babyface gimmick. But she couldn't actually skate. That was when the people first started kind of turning on her. They made fun of her for not being able to skate. So now that she's a heel, like she should go all in with that uh, that skateboard. But anyway, that's tonight, everybody. <laughs> so check it out. I bet you Carmelo and Vinci steal the show. That's what I'm thinking. I would think there's a very good possibility of that happening. WWE is touting record-breaking ticket sale numbers for WrestleMania 39. After tickets went on sale to the general public Friday, WWE issued a press release this morning announcing that WrestleMania 39 has set a record for first-day ticket sales. More than 90,000 tickets for the two-night event were sold within the first 24 hours, which WWE says is a 42% increase over first-day ticket sales for WrestleMania 38. SoFi Stadium, Inglewood, California. Hosting this show April 1st and 2nd. Fourth straight year that WrestleMania has been held over two nights. 42% increase over first day ticket sales for last year. And as I've talked about uh, many times, I'm not going to WrestleMania when it's two nights. And the, the main reason for that? Well, there actually were two reasons for that. Let's be honest. One, it pretty much sucked. For the last uh, several years. Oh, my God. And, uh, and two, I, I hate go. getting in and out of the, the stadium. Old and Man River. No, no, no. Old Man River. Dude, Old Man River, singer to the mic now, hasn't gone to WrestleMania in probably 30 years, if ever. I went every single solitary so? year for 15 years. What does that have so, to do with anything? So I'm, Look, I am allowed to talk about the difficulty of getting is... in and out of this stadium. Hey. Can I continue? So no. my point is... My point is, those are the two reasons I never went, okay? Now, the product is better, okay? So that's still not enough for me, though. There, there's only two things that are going to get me back to WrestleMania. Are you ready for this? Yeah. The product has to be awesome, in which case I will go. Uh-huh. Or or I need to get on that bus. They have the bus gimmick where you could take a bus and you get priority entry in and priority entry out. The Lex if I can, Express? If I can get out of that Lex Express, I'll go. <laughs> Other than that, I ain't going. Well, that is because you've done this thing. You're older now. You have no time for this anymore in your life with so much that you have going on. But for a lot of people... This is how they're going to know WrestleMania, because I don't think two nights is going to stop. And I think as long as they can pull it off, which they're probably going to be able to now into the future, whether it be at an arena or at a stadium, I think two nights is here to stay. And we may not like it. You may be more preferable to have it in one shot, but it's working for them. So that's just the way this thing is going to go. And that's the way that people need to adjust themselves. And this company is on fire. I don't know if you guys are aware of it or not. Following update at 10 a.m. Eastern Tuesday, 2022. You know, I remember, um, I remember, I think it was uh, 2001. I I wrote a headline for Figure Four Weekly. I think it was 2001. And uh, WWE had had grossed $456 million for the year. It was just this gigantic, gigantic number, $456 million over the course of a year. And uh, that was like the absolute peak of the the Attitude Era in terms of revenue, $456 million. I'll never forget that number. And uh, here we are. It's 2022. WWE's second quarter revenues. Second quarter. One of four quarters in a year. $328 million for the quarter... An increase of over $63 million from this quarter last year. And they added the, quote, substantially complete investigation of uh, Vince McMahon. They addressed some of the uh, the costs of that. And, uh, and let's go into it here. 
There's actually a couple of different pages here because a lot of things happen today. So many, in fact, that I have to uh, scroll and scroll and scroll. All right. Uh, the investigation. They spent $1.7 million in quarter two in general admin expenses for this investigation. $1.7 million to investigate a bunch of uh, NDAs. And, quote, currently estimate anticipate spending approximately $10 million during the remainder of the year related to this investigation. Way to go, Vince. <laughs> Thus far, McMahon has paid $2.2 million this year. $1.2 million during the first six months of 2021. He has paid or will pay the total of $19.6 million of unrecorded expenses. I know people have tried to explain this to me a million times. I, I don't get it. He's he's paid out of his own pocket, allegedly nineteen point six million. Now he has to pay the company back nineteen point six million. So essentially, he's paying forty million. I still don't understand. If anybody can explain this to me, I'd love to hear it. But anyway, he's still paying. Net revenue up to three hundred twenty-eight million, up from last year's two hundred sixty-five million. The uh, live event revenue and consumer products were primary drivers. North American ticket sales, $34. Million, up $6.6 million from last year. Obviously, it's going to be way up because they're touring again, which they weren't doing last year. But uh, they, their uh, live attendance, 10 times what they did last year. Again, because they weren't touring. But we can talk about more of this after the break. Raw and more Observer Live. Come. Well, this is odd. Set. This was up 15 minutes ago on our own front page. Mm-hmm. Report. Notable AEW wrestler claims they were contacted by WWE. The AEW roster member was described as one, quote, who is known to be under contract. WWE is alleged to have reached out to a notable member of the AEW roster. According to a report from Fightful Select, an unnamed wrestler has informed AEW management that they were contacted by WWE regarding working for them. The AW roster member was described as one, quote, who is known to be under contract at a full-time performer with the company. The unnamed talent informed AW management of the situation because they felt the company's higher-ups deserved to know. They also informed AW they have no interest in leaving and told WWE they were happy where they were. The report continues to say, quote, the claim was... It was a member of WWE's talent relations department that made contact with the AEW talent. WWE has brought back multiple previously released wrestlers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I didn't hear the story till right now. And uh, (laughs) here's what I'm going to say about this, okay? Because I don't know what's going on. I did. I did. uh, I'll just put it this way. You, you can't you can't do this contract tampering. Uh, and and the, the funny thing is everybody knows that. Y- you there are feelers sent out uh, to various people where, you know, maybe somebody would ask through somebody to ask somebody, you know, what's your what's your contract status? You know, I asked my friend, my friend asked the other friend, the friend happened to ask this, you know, there 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 are ways to ask questions. But to outright call somebody who's under contract and say, hey, do you want to come back? Like, you can't do that. So the story is weird because, you know, WWE knows you can't do that. And I would presume that the people working in talent relations know that you can't do that, at least in such a direct manner. Trust me, people are asking about things all the time. Don't think that, that people in WWE and AEW and everywhere else are constantly wondering what's going on and this and that. But directly asking the talent, like calling them up on the phone. Let's say, you know, I'm going to call, let's say I'm I'm not John Laurinaitis, obviously, but whoever, I actually don't even know who has John Laurinaitis' job now. Is it Hunter? But now Hunter's got the other job. So somebody else must have gotten Hunter's talent relations job. Let's say it's uh, uh, Frank Lee. Okay, Frank Lee. Say Frank Lee is in, in charge of talent relations. Frank Lee can't just, you know, call Keith Lee and say, hey, buddy, are you under contract or do you want to come back to what? You can't, you can't do that. So I'm not saying that this is what happened, okay? I'm not saying this is what happened because I don't know what happened. But this story is so bizarre that the only thing that makes sense to me 
is uh, Frank Lee or whoever called somebody who he did not know that they were under contract to AEW. And he asked them if they were interested in coming back. They were like, bro, I'm, I'm signed to AEW. Now, the only problem with that theory is uh, whatever happened was done in such a way that this talent apparently went to AEW management and told them what was going on. So that aspect of the story suggests to me that maybe that's not what happened. Maybe Frank Lee did call the talent directly and try to get them. So I don't know what's going on, but, dude, you can't do that. Uh, Have we learned nothing from the Monday Night Wars? So I guess we'll see uh, if anything comes from this. Yeah, it could it could be nothing, and it is uh, it may actually be John Cone. He's the senior manager of talent relations, so I don't know if this buck would stop with him or if it's Triple H or who it is. But this is either a big mistake or it's really nothing. It, who who knows? It's just it's tough for me to believe that it's full scale tampering because it's hard for me to believe that they would be that stupid. Like somebody reaching out to MGF going, you know, Hey, is all this stuff real? I heard you quit or whatever it is. You, you know what I mean? Like I, it's so hard for me to believe that that could be the case, but you never know. Maybe it is. Well, I guess we'll have to see how things dribble out uh, any more from this story. It, it's just, to me, it's like Occam's razor. What is more likely the WWE blatantly attempted, you know, to call an AEW talent and ask if they wanted to go to WWE when they were under AEW contract, or somebody was stupid. Stupid. Well, it sounds to me, I mean, the more obvious, I mean, both of them are stupid, but I mean, on purpose stupid or accidental stupid? I would defer to accidental stupid, but I don't know. (laughs) Which But one way or the other, this was stupid. Well. Not Occam and Razor. You guys know nothing about nothing? Nothing. Nothing got, from nothing is nothing. All right. Well, I got more news here. Mm-hmm. I got more to talk about. WWE stock, by the way, $73.11 right now. Up yeah, it's on a fire, dollar. dude. Fire. We should get rid of Vince more often. <laughs> should bring him back and get rid of him again. <laughs> no, not after Raw last night. I'm, I'm pretty good with this. You know, I'm pretty good with Raw as well, but uh, we're going to go into the Raw report in the next segment. But this, this was my takeaway from Raw, okay? The show, to me, is objectively significantly better, okay? There's no 24-7 stupidity. There was only one bad finish on the show. The matches all got time. The matches were, for the most part, good to very good. But uh, here's here's the big issue. And this was only one show, so I don't want to... I don't want to say this is like a... This is a, a look at the future or anything like that, but... I remember in uh, 94, 95, I first started watching UFC, and dude, it was awesome. And every few months there was a new UFC, and dudes were fighting each other. It was awesome. And then it became a sport. And it was still awesome for a long time. And then uh, we got Ultimate Fighter in 2005, 2006, and that show was awesome. Bunch of crazy, just totally nutty dudes in a house going stir-crazy, fighting each other, urinating in each other's salads. And uh, it was awesome. And then there was, like, uh, Tough 2, Tough 3, Tough 4, Tough 5, Tough 18, Tough 19, Tough, you know, Brazil versus Iceland, whatever. And, uh, you know, I just was done with it. And then, you know, there's a UFC every single solitary weekend. And I know a lot of you like that, okay, but... For me personally, I also teach and train jujitsu. So every day I see dudes rolling and, and like, bro, I need more than just, hey, here's, uh, here's seven fights with dudes you've never heard of before. Just a bunch of randos having fights. Like, I don't care. So here's my point. This Raw show was like, the matches were good and everything like that. But, man, I'm watching that AJ Styles-Bobby Lashley match. It's going on for an eternity. It just goes on and 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 on. And then we're getting the main event, and it's another 15-minute match. It's just going on and on and on and on. And uh, and it really it struck me that, you know, this is sports entertainment. And do I need to see the 24-7 guys chasing somebody through the building and doing it? But no, I don't need to see that stupid stuff. But this is supposed to be a variety show. And say what you will about Vince, and more so say what you will about his idea of what's funny and entertaining. But he did understand 
that pro wrestling was a variety show. And from day one, dude, go all the way back to TNT and the stuff in the 80s and Saturday Night's Main Event and, you know, the Attitude Era. and all. I mean, he understood it's a variety show. You can't just do a bunch of good matches. There's got to be more. And last night's show did not feel like a variety show. Last night's show felt like, here's a bunch of really good matches. And I'm fine with good matches, but on a three-hour show... Dude, I need some variety. I need something to spice it up to keep me awake. Because I was struggling on that show to stay awake. And, uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was a weird feeling watching the show. I'm like, this is objectively better. I like more wrestling. I like longer matches. But I think it's the three-hour aspect and only having 30 yeah. minutes of content per hour. It just dragged on and on and on. But not well, in a bad way, just in a, in a long way. But that's why I can't complain about it is because at least I got the wrestling and at least Styles and Lashley w was good, you know, up till the end. We're not not actually the end of that was fine. It was the the end of Drew and Kevin Owens, which that whole thing I thought was magnificent with Kevin Owens and them going back and forth with each other on the microphone. And then you have that match. The Usos obviously came out. They did it for storyline purposes with Kevin Owens being owed one now in his mind from Roman Reigns. So I thought the stories were good. I thought they did a good job. And yes, I agree with you. I think when the Muppet Show works, it works spectacularly. And when they do hit it off, it's great. But you know, I'm not going to complain at all about this. Let the things dictate go the way that they're going to go and let the wacky kind of take its course however it takes its course. But I'm not going to complain about this. That show being three hours is hell. It absolutely is. But if it's not going to change, I would rather lean towards having a little bit more wrestling and having it be a little bit duller as opposed to what we've been getting. You know, the balance, obviously, they need to have a balance. And I hope they find it. Well, as guys going, are we really complaining about more wrestling? It's not that there's more wrestling. Like, the issue is... You can have as much wrestling as you want, but the matches, if you can have an, if you can have a show that's nothing but wrestling, like a pay-per-view, the matches have to all be meaningful. You can't just do a three-hour show with a bunch of long matches that are not meaningful. I realize that AJ and Bobby Lashley was for the, the title, but why? They announced it Monday afternoon. Hey, we're going to do a match tonight for the title, these two guys. And the main event is Dolph, Ziggler, and Theory for 15 minutes. Why? There was no reason for it. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. Well, let's uh, do that Raw report here. There was actually a lot of good stuff on Raw. It was a third hour that was the issue, more than anything else. So the show opened up with a Judgment Day segment with Rhea Ripley, Finn Balor, and Damian Priest. And uh, Damian Priest got to go out there and cut a promo on Edge for their match next week in Toronto. And he cut a hell of a promo. It's a very, very good promo. And they, uh, they do their promo. Ray jumps him from behind. And uh, twice, Rhea Ripley got in his way. And he cannot bring himself to hit a woman, even though she's daring him to hit her. And uh, this allowed them to jump him, beat him up, put a chair on him, hit the coup de grace, lay him out. And uh, stand tall. So clearly we've got the the uh, edge match with uh, Damian Priest leading to a tag match with these guys. And then whatever's going to happen with old Dominic. Not Dom. That's producer Dom. He's the only Dom that I acknowledge. Then we had Oscar and Alexa Bliss versus Dewdrop and Nikki Ash. They went nine minutes. Pretty good match. I mean, it was, a, it was actually... You know, for what I was expecting out of this women's tournament, it was a very good match. And Nikki Ash is no longer doing the superhero. She's just out there wrestling, although she still has the mask on. And we had uh, Bianca Belair at ringside. Bunch of near falls there at the end. And then uh, Bliss uh, knocks Nikki to the outside. Oscar puts Dewdrop in a wacky lucha submission. And she quits. And so Asuka and Alexa Bliss have moved on in the women's tag team tournament. We had a confrontation with uh, the Babyfaces and then Bailey, Eo, and Dakota, which sets up their match, their six-person match, which is coming up at the Clash at the Castle. We had a theory interview. Dolph Ziggler walked up. It's one of those things that they do. 
I talked about how, what was the point of this match in the main event? Well, they just shot an angle to do the match. And, of course, the angle is, you know, Theory tells Ziggler, you've never really made it to the very top. You're wasted potential, blah, blah, blah. This leads to the match. And, of course, Ziggler has, it's not his fault, but a lot of wasted potential here. He's just been some bloke most of the time he's been in this company. And so, really, they they told us it's a guy that, you know, Austin Theory against this guy that never reaches potential. And that was the main event. And I was bored during the match. We had a Ciampa and Miz interview, which uh, they talked about AJ Styles. And this led to a tag match. Ciampa and The Miz against the returning Cedric Alexander and Mustafa Ali. They are now a team. And, of course, Chomp and the Miz won. But they got 10 minutes. They worked the match to try to make you think that maybe Cedric and Ali could win. The finish was awesome. As Ali goes for a 450. And Chompa hits his running knee strike, hitting him out of midair. And he pins him with a fairy tale ending. It's a good match. Miz got a bloody nose. I think he hit his face on Cedric's knee. His knee was going, uh, Cedric was going for the Michinoka driver. That was a good match. We had uh, Drew McIntyre, Kevin Owens. This whole segment was the best thing on the show by miles and miles. McIntyre comes out. He cuts his great promo. Roman's not here. But you know what? You're not going to have to worry about no champion after this Clash of the Castle because I'm going to win the title. And here's a list of great wrestlers I could defend the title against. Starts rattling off these names. Does not mention Kevin Owens' name. So Kevin Owens comes out. He's upset that he was not mentioned. And he cuts his promo and says, you know what? There's a big difference between you and I. You walk around in a kilt. You walk around with a sword. You don't even know who you are. But you know what? I know who I am. And Drew is set off. And he cuts this fiery promo about how, don't ever tell me I don't know who I am. I know exactly who I am. I'm the guy that 15 years ago they called the chosen one. Then I got fired. And I went out there and I busted my ass all over the world. And I worked and I got better. And ultimately, I never called them back. They called me. And I came back and I won that title multiple times. And you know what? I'm sick of all this talk. I'm a wrestler. You're a wrestler. Let's have a wrestling match. And this crowd's going crazy for this promo. And Kevin Owens says, let's do it. And they ring the bell. They had a great match. 15-minute match. Awesome. Until Drew sets up for the Claymore. And they they zoom in close. Because they don't want you to see there's going to be a run-in. Except you know when they zoom in close there's going to be a run-in. And you can also hear the fans going, boo, as he's setting up for his finisher. And so, of course, the Usos run in. And they attack Drew McIntyre for the disqualification. And uh, he makes his own comeback. Tells him he's coming for Roman Reigns on Friday. I mean, aside from the finish, this was awesome. And uh, I would have beaten Kevin Owens. It doesn't matter. He could still challenge for the title in a month. It's not going to hurt Kevin Owens to lose an awesome match like this. You as Triple H tell the fans, dude, most of the time when we do a match this long, you're going to get a finish. Don't condition these people to know that, man, we're going to give you good long matches, but if there are stars involved, you may not get a finish. Seth Rollins came out laughing. God, I'm sick of this laughing. Riddle shows up on the big screen. He's actually in the building. He rushes down to the ring. We have another brawl. Riddle lays him out and then challenges him to a match at Clash at the Castle. That's about where the great stuff on this show ended. Veer squashed Bo Keller, but he didn't. This Bo Keller guy kept avoiding stuff and outsmarting him. Then he got killed. I was like, what was the point? Just kill this guy. And then it was over. It's just like, it's over. You know? What are we doing with Veer? Can we, can we get going here? Dude, I've been watching this for months. Don't waste my time. Let's move on to something here. And we had an interview with Kai, Bailey, and Sky, and they talked about this and that. Bobby Lashley, AJ Styles. Twenty-two at times glorious minutes. Usually not. The match was fine. 
come on. But it, it went on forever, and they there were moments where they're just standing there, like somebody forgot a spot, and they're just looking at each other, which never happens in AJ matches. And it went on so long. I haven't seen this happen in a long time. It went on so long that they start, they start doing near falls at the end, and it's two baby faces. And guy goes for the cover, the crowd kicks out, the, the crowd boos. Guy goes for another finish, the guy kicks out, the crowd boos. They're like, waiting, can we get to the end of this match already and get on something else? So don't even yell at me about this, because this was the, the crowd was feeling exactly like I was. Get this match over with already. And finally, Bobby speared him, pinned him. Huge pop, because it was over. <laughs> that, uh, that went too long. And in the middle of this, by the way, they did the deal where Dexter Loomis showed up and jumped the rail, and everybody goes after him. Security drags him off, and we go right to commercial. I don't know why Dexter Loomis, who has the most non-shoot gimmick in the company, is doing a gimmick where he's trying to get into the building, and it's a shoot. It's, it's bizarre. Dakota Kai beat uh, Dana Brooke. Title not on the line, even though she comes to the ring with the 24-7 title. I have no earthly idea the point of this. It happened, and it was over. Just something to do on a show. Two minutes. And then the main event was once again Theory versus Ziggler. And uh, this was the main event of the show. There was nothing on the line. There were a lot of chin locks still by Austin Theory. They wrestled and wrestled and wrestled and wrestled and went to a break and wrestled and wrestled and wrestled. And then finally Ziggler goes for the fame asser and Theory turns it into the ATL, or whatever he calls it, he pins him, he celebrates, the show ends. No angle, no what's next for old A-Town down here, nothing. They just had a match, like a WWE main event, like it was a main event caliber match. It ended, and it was over. Okay. Hey, great first two hours. Third hour, yikes. That's my review. May I? Sure. Of course, it's your job. Talk already. The third hour, you're not wrong about. And I thought the positioning of that match as the main event was crazy. And I know you don't want to give non-finishes in main events on shows, but I thought it would have been a lot more effective if Drew McIntyre and Kevin Owens... And I don't know where that was strategically placed on the show. I was not keeping notes on that, where this was top of the hour, bottom, whatever it was. But I thought, in hindsight, that should have been the main event of the show with the Usos coming out there. You have Kevin Owens saying something. You have Kevin Owens' good friend, Sami Zayn, who he referenced in his promo leading into that match, still you know, in the mix with the Usos. I thought it was something that could have carried on to the next show. I thought that would have made a lot more sense. Theory and Ziggler, it's fine if you want to do it. It's giving Theory something to do. It's teaching him, obviously, how to be a little bit better working with Dolph Ziggler, but I didn't think it needed to be the main event, but they think he's a main event guy. I, I don't see it right now as of yet. I think you're being a little hard on Styles and Lashley. I thought it did go a little bit too long, but again, goes back to what I say. I will take that over a bunch of goofiness and having that match being you know a lot shorter than we would want it to be. Uh, Mustafa Ali, Cedric Alexander, I know you want to debut a team usually with a win. I'm okay with having them lose to Miz and Ciampa. If Miz and Ciampa, they're, look, I thought maybe you could turn Ciampa into something a little bit more of what he was, but he is leaning hard into this character. He and the Miz are a good team together. They really are. And if they happen to be a regular tag team, Great. Actually, I'm all for that being a foil, them being another heel foil. So it's not just Alpha Academy over there being that team. So I thought that worked out really well. You mentioned how cool the finish was. And I think when it comes to Dakota Kai and Dana Brooke, yeah, it was a match that just sort of happened, but I'll take that match because Dakota Kai got a victory. And this is what we've talked about with trying to build up some credibility with people. You're going to have to have some people that get a wins majority of the time, even if it's against people like Dana Brooke. But let's establish a pecking order here and Dakota Kai going out there getting a victory again. 
being introduced more to the regular WWE fans who don't watch NXT, I thought that stuff worked itself out really well. This show would have been miles better if the main event would have been Kevin Owens and Drew McIntyre. Because not only would it have been a great main event, but you're doing a run-in, at least a run-in's at the end of the show. Because by putting the run-in where they did, all of a sudden, all of those other matches, I'm like, God, there are 20 minutes into this AJ match. When's somebody going to run in? Yeah. I thought the same thing for the Ziggler match. It's like, you conditioned me early that you'll have dudes run in after a 20-minute match. So if you had had clean finish, clean finish, clean finish, clean finish, clean finish, clean finish, you do the big match at the end with those two guys having a great match, and then, yes, the Usos run in, but they did get beaten up afterwards. Drew McIntyre stood tall. Drew McIntyre says, I'll see you Friday. It's a cliffhanger, and you have the baby face standing tall at the end of the show instead of Captain Briefcase. (laughs) <laughs> great point that is an absolutely great point yeah and that's you're exactly right everything would have played itself out itself out better leading itself into smackdown although i did watch the last night of the new japan g1 and with the stories that were told there i think they did a i would dare say did a much better job leading into the finals than wwe did leading into smackdown you know i didn't mention the family the elias family photo Oh. But uh, I do want to mention that uh, Elias has been beaten up by Kevin Owens, and he's he's in the hospital now. And they say it's going to be a long time before he gets back. And uh, I can only hope. I know this is comedy, and they want to do serious stuff with Kevin Owens. Ezekiel. I don't care. No. Elias is going to return. Ah. Full beard. Like. And Kevin Owens is going to freak out and say, he's not Elias. He's Ezekiel. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Realize that you geeks think that I am nothing but a gimmick with my love of NXT 2.0. But uh, I'll tell you one thing about myself, everybody. I am many things, but I am not a gimmick. (laughs) And one thing that I forgot to preview, I just remembered, for NXT 2.0 tonight, Mm -hmm. is last week on the program... Ulyssa Leone and Valentina Faraz met with Sangha. And they said, oh, we were eliminated from this tournament. Someday we would like to be champions. Sangha, what can we do? And Sangha said, ladies, you remind me of these other ladies. Katana Chance and Caden Carter. They, too, struggled for years, but finally they ascended to the top of that mountain and became the champions. You, ladies, can do the same thing. And next week, he says, I will teach you to clear your mind. So today, at Heat Wave, Sangha will be clearing the minds of Ulyssa Leon and Valentina Faraz, and I can't wait! Excuse me? You heard me. I don't know what they're going to do, but, dude, I can't wait. Dude, what about Tiffany Stratton and uh, Wendy Chu? Do we get any, like... Who cares about them? I'm getting... I'm getting... Sangha! She stole Randy Orton's night vision goggles, for heaven's sakes. Golly. I can't wait to talk about it tomorrow. It's coming up tonight, everybody. NXT 2.0. Are you going to be here tomorrow? I sure am. We don't go home till Friday. So I'm here to talk about my favorite show. I'll be later on tonight. Brian, Vinny, and Craig show. Got a lot to get into there. And that's it, everybody. We'll talk to you again after a while.